Good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Druin, manager of the library's Missouri Valley Special Collections. Thank you for joining us for another online installment of our Signature Sunday series. We look forward to the day when we can once again hold events inside our auditorium, but until that time, we'll continue to offer a variety of online programming. Today's program, titled From What Is Blocked to Wicked a City, is co-presented by the Historic West Bottoms Association in conjunction with its six annual Heritage Days. The library is proud to be a partner in celebrating the fascinating history of the West Bottoms. At this time, I'll invite Christy Chester of the Historic West Bottoms to say a few words about events and programs taking place during Heritage, Heritage Days. Christy. Thank you, glad to be here. Heritage Day started out as Heritage Week and it started in 2015 by honoring the 12th Street Viaduct's 100th birthday. And that, that year we only had about three big events. Uh, then we moved on and made it uh, two weeks and now we're up to a whole month. And we have about eight events going on and they will run from, well, which they started on Friday with a ribbon cutting of a beautiful historical marker about the West Bottoms that's down on Hickory at 11th Street. And then we're going to be going on to today, which is the uh, learning about the wettest block. Then we go to a social on uh, the Stockyards District on the about the call. Then you're also all invited to a meeting at the historic West Bottoms meeting, which will be at the ship on June 14th. We also have a dinner, a big dinner that night. If you can go online and get your ticket, then we have the KCIC and the West Bottoms Association at Lemon Park. And then we're going to have a bottom sub barbecue, breaking the bread picnic, and strawberry swing craft fair. So we have quite a few things going on, and it's going to be fun. So just go on to our website, WHB, or yeah, HWB, excuse me, dash KC.com, and you'll find the events. You can sign up and find find which one you would love to go to because we would love to have you. Thank you, Christy. Uh, yes, yes, I encourage everyone to head down to the West Bottoms and join the funds. It sounds great. Um, now it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, John Simonson. John is a good friend of the library and longtime user of the Missouri Valley Special Collections. We are thrilled to have him back as returning Missouri Valley Sunday speaker. John is an independent writer and editor who makes his home in Kansas City, Missouri, and whose work has appeared in several newspapers, magazines, and websites. For nearly a decade, he published articles on Kansas City history for his blog, Harris of the Plains. It was one of the first blogs dedicated to Kansas City history and also one of the best. John is the author of three books by the History Press. Harris of the Plains, Kansas City from Doughboys to Expressways, Kansas City 1940, A Watershed Year, and most recently, Prohibition in Kansas City, Highballs, Spooners, and Crooked Dice. Welcome, John. It's great, it's great to have you back. Well, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks, Christy, and everyone who's made this possible today. Uh, I have a lot of material to cover and we should get started right away. We're gonna start with a little time traveling. If I can uh, get this to work. It was working just fine. There we go. Sorry. All right, so we time travel here to uh, the summer of 1907 uh, in Kansas City, and we're picking up the copy of the Kansas City Times. Uh, 
Monday is always a slow news day. Uh, this one tells us that the Monday is going to be cloudy with maybe a shower, temperatures in the low 80s. Um, there's a couple of small local stories on the front page. One is from the Union Depot down in the West Bottoms. It's about a woman who's traveling cross country by train, of course, uh, with her caged parrot. And uh, another story is about the planning committee uh, meeting for the new Union Station that's being built. But the lead story today is this one. Uh, it's about a single block of 9th Street down near the state line that holds 24 saloons. The Times has come up with a name for it. It's called the wettest block in America. And I have to just throw this in here. It does refer to Bell Street, uh, the block between Bell and State Line. Every map I've found uh, from the time and from today as well indicates that that street is actually uh, Genesee, not Bell. But uh, we'll call that a typo and maybe someone can explain that to me later. But anyway, how did this block get to be so wet? And whatever happened to the wettest block? I think it might be a good idea to step back a little further in time to a younger Kansas City in its early center of activity. Uh, that stretch of Main Street north of Missouri Avenue that uh, looks like this today, um, this is how it looked in 1870. And that's Marble Hall on the left there. That was where Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp once played. Um, early on, it was a, de a, a neighborhood that was uh, dedicated to vice in all forms. Behind us, as we stand here on uh, Missouri Avenue, number three, uh, was what was called the biggest gambling house between the Mississippi and the Rockies. Lace curtains, ornate brass, mahogany tables, chandeliers, overstuffed chairs, well-mannered waiters serving food and drink, every man, every gambling game uh, known to the West, including Faro, Kino, Roulette, Chuckaluck, Stud Poker, etc. So the guy who ran that place was named Bob Bobati. A little later, this stretch of Main Street was uh, known as Battle Row for uh, its raucous saloons, one of which was run by a guy named Jim Pendergast. It's fun as I said uh, a little earlier, to stand at this place now and think about Marble Hall and Bob Cote and Jim Pendergast. Both of those guys could uh, actually tell us stories about the area we know as the West Bottoms. Uh, in 1881, after the state of Missouri cracked down on gambling, Bob Cote had to move his game out of Missouri, so he just came down here uh, just across the line in Kansas and set it up on um, what was then called West, West 6th Street, but now is called uh, Central Avenue. And Jim Pendergast, who came from St. Joe in 1876, opened his first saloon and boarding house down here in 1884 on St. Louis Avenue uh, near Hickory. And that's where he began building his uh, patronage that would eventually fuel the political machine. So it was very different from today. The area bounded by two rivers on the north and west, 23rd Street on the south, and the bus on the east. It went by various names, uh, French Bottoms, West Kansas, uh, referring to the fact that it was the western portion of the town of Kansas, I think, uh, the Central Industrial District, and the West Bottoms. It was almost a separate town in the 19th century especially because the main way to get there was by a horse-drawn horse -drawn railway that uh, descended the, the bluffs before there were the cable cars. So uh, the Hannibal Bridge, uh, which, which was the first span across the Missouri River, opened in 1869 and brought railroads into the West Bottoms. Uh, with the new bridge and the railroads, attention turned to livestock and the growing meat. The stockyards began on 13 and a half acres as a market for Western livestock. Now cattle from Texas and the Southwest 
to be brought by trail and rail to markets in the east via the new bridge. In 1871, a collaboration between the railroads and the cattlemen created a livestock exchange, uh, which was first located on 16th Street, just across the state line uh, in Kansas. Uh, this location, 16th and Genesee, is actually where the current Livestock Exchange building sits. So the first stock pens were places for the animals to rest and get fat before being shipped east for slaughter. Uh, train loads of Texas longhorns unloaded down here every day. Cowboys could be found in the many places of refreshment around this intersection. Meat packing followed. The stockyards expanded exponentially over the years, and by 1892, were second only sh to Chicago in size and production. They also brought other related industry to the bottoms. There were several packing plants on both sides of the state line. Ultimately, these became a big four, Armour, Cudahy, Wilson, and Swift. Armour was the first of these larger plants opening in 1871 as Plankinton and Armour's. And it was located uh, just across the line in Kansas uh, in that little thumb of land between rivers where they come together. By 1892, it had become Armour and Company and had expanded to several large three and four story buildings over several acres, uh, employing between 5,000 and 6,000 workers, and it was capable of slaughtering 6,000 head of cattle and 14,000 hogs every day. Other plants were a mile or so up the river in Armordale on the west bank of the Cog. Of course, the bridge brought passenger traffic to Kansas City too, and the first glimpse of Kansas City for many travelers occurred the depot was built in 1877 and opened in April of 78. It had replaced a few scattered depots and a large station in the same location. It was fronted by Union Avenue, uh, which looks like this today. We're looking back towards the northeast toward the bluffs there. And back in the day, this was that same viewpoint. A busy thoroughfare of hotels, like the Blossom House there on the left, it was called one of the best known hotels in the West. Uh, there were saloons, liquor dealers, brothels, and places specialized in fleecing their customers, such as saloons that invited travelers to store their baggage free while drinking there, and then they charged them for storage afterwards. By the turn of the century, the saloons in the depot neighborhood outnumbered those in the other areas of the West Bottoms. The Pendergast Saloon was a couple blocks northwest of this, uh, and this neighborhood um, essentially dried up when the depot, uh, when the new Union Station was built in 1918. So this map shows uh, the line of uh, storefronts right across from the Union Station. Um, the station is at the bottom and uh, the uh, storefronts are across the middle there. Uh, it does say, if you look closely at that map, 20 of those storefronts are saloons. There's also a number of wholesale liquor dealers in the area, largely selling by mail order, and they represent uh, Ken to Kentucky distillers, although there were a few local distillers in Kansas City, including the Blue Valley Distillery in Leeds, which was owned by Glasner and Bars and Liquor Wholesale Dealers uh, down here in the Bottoms. Um, and of course, uh, various saloons that were advertising themselves as being right across from the station. The 1880s were a boom decade for Kansas City. The population more than doubled. The first electric lights were installed. The first paving stones were laid in streets, and the bottoms was be, uh, becoming the wholesale and manufacturing center of town. This is a map of the bottoms of right before the turn of the century. The city's uh, second police station, which was the second precinct, uh, the first being the one uh, at about 4th and Main Street, 
opened here in, uh, early in the 1880s. Eventually, it moved to Mulberry Street at St. La St. Louis Avenue between State Line and the Depot. They walked the beats in those days, tried to keep the con artists away from travelers at the Depot, and tried to keep the peace at the saloons. But many of them were related to saloon keepers, so that there was a comfortable relationship there. Plenty of trouble, too. A black man named Levi Harrington, described by co-workers as an honest and industrious family man, was lynched down here in April 1882. You may remember this story being in the news last year when a plaque about the lynching was vandalized. So he'd gone to Monaghan Saloon down on 9th Street for a beer and a political meeting. Hearing gunshots near Hickory and St. Louis, he ran to see what had happened. A policeman had been shot dead. Later, Carrington was misidentified as the shooter carried by a mob to the bridge at Bluff Street and hanged and shot. Despite the growth of industry in the bottoms, for years, it was also a residential area. So this is a detail from that map we were just looking at showing, uh, well, actually just left of center is the intersection uh, between 9th and State Line. And then just to the right of that is the huge armor plant and uh, you can see scattered about a number of uh, smaller structures, which are houses, many of them shacks. So uh, most of these people, uh, well, the, the population at one time was almost 5,000 people. Most of them were laborers that worked 12 hour days and seven day weeks in packing plants or freight houses. Many were African-Americans and later came immigrants from Eastern Europe. Some of them lived south of 12th Street, but also in these neighborhoods around the armor plant. Early on, lots of crime stories in newspapers originated in what was called Hell's Half Acre on the Missouri side, roughly bounded by State Line 9th, the river, uh, the Missouri River, and Santa Fe Avenue on the east. Uh, reportedly, it dated to about 1869, right after the new bridge was completed. And the workers, both black and white, mostly poor, were living in shacks scattered around the hillsides and lowlands, but were displaced by the new railroad tracks coming into the bottoms. So some of the whites went to work for the railroad and were able to live in railroad housing, but most of the blacks clustered over by the state line in tiny shacks a few feet apart. This became a rough area known for robberies, knife fights, gun plays, gun, gun play and murders. One saloon uh, nearby reportedly became headquarters for, quote, this is in the star coverage, the lowest thugs and petty thieves, prostitutes, and general scum of society, always ready to provoke a fight and escape arrest by crossing the state line. <clears throat> Another area that came a little bit later was called the Patch. It was about two square blocks just across the line in Kansas. Uh, it was mostly European immigrants who worked in the packing plants, again, living in tiny shacks along dirt alleys, as many as 20 in one home. And then there was a place called Toad a Loop, which was an area uh, straddling the state line near Turkey Creek, close to what today is High V Arena. Uh, the name comes from the French Tour de Loup, or Walk of the Wolf, for the wolves that once lived in dens along the river bluffs. It was also a community of Russians and Poles, reportedly about 300 families by 1891. Early on, it was described as a dingy collection of hovels on Turkey Creek between the Santa Fe rail yards and the bluffs, frequented by the pickpocket, thief, thug, or professional assassin. So Wagner Saloon, which is uh, right there on the map, uh, was described as a resort for thieves and criminals of all kinds. It straddled the state line with the bar in Missouri and the customers primarily in Kansas. Patrons could escape prosecution by moving from one side of the saloon to the other, depending on which police force arrived. Uh, it was actually ahead of its time because there were a couple of infamous uh, joints in during the wide open 1930s that operated similarly right on the state line. 
So uh, this was the 1880 map of the Kansas side showing the separate cities. There's the city of Wyandotte, which was established in 1859. Uh, Kansas City, Kansas at that time was just that little thumb of land between the state line and the Kansas River up there. And Armordale, that was, uh, KCK was established in 1872 and Armordale was established in 1882. They were all consolidated as Kansas City, Kansas in 1886. So during the territorial period of Kansas, prohibition had been a big issue. In 1880, the state's voters approved the nation's first constitutional prohibition. Existing saloons had until May 1881 to dispose of their stock and close up. The word on the street was that this would cause saloons to move just across the state line into Missouri. And in fact, uh, a new one opened just the same month, uh, just across the line in Missouri, cheekily named the St. John Beer Gardens in honor of the Republican governor who led the amendment effort. So Governor St. John called saloons a curse to any people. More crime, poverty, misery, and degradation flow from them than from all other sources combined, he said. He didn't mention the revenue that also flowed from them to their towns. So some saloons did close, many stayed open. And new ones, many with gambling, sprouted in those Kansas towns that maintained a system of fines to replace the lost revenue. Unofficially, the somewhat discreet fine system allowed saloons to flourish openly in the same places over the next quarter century. In 1889, the president of the McCormick Distillery up in Weston said his best customers were in Kansas towns. In 1898, Armadale was said to have more than 30 saloons around the packing plants and mills, reportedly compared with those in Kansas City, Missouri, with mirrors and bar fixtures of elegant design and great splendor. So all of this was just inspiration for the anti-saloon groups made, uh, made up largely of women. The spiritual leader was Carrie Nation who broke up saloons with her hatchet. In 1901, she visited Kansas City, Missouri, stopping in several 12th Street saloons to tell the patrons that they, quote, were on the high road to hell and demanded the paintings of naked women be removed. Then she was jailed for causing a crowd to block the street. She was fined $500 and she told the judge that quote, all of the hell broth shipped into Kansas comes from Kansas City. Now the hell broth largely came from breweries who owned or financial, or owned or financed almost all saloons on both sides of the state line. This particular saloon, uh, was in Kansas City, Missouri on Grand Street, about 20, I think the address says 24, 27. Um, saloons were supposed to have screens or curtains covering the front windows and doors, as you can, you can see here. Many had just a long bar with a brass rail to put your foot on, no tables. Men patrons only, although many had separate wine rooms for women, no drinking together. In 1911, it was estimated that 15% of Kansas City homes had no plumbing, especially in the poorer neighborhoods. Now, saloons provided a bucket of water at every beer purchase. Saloons also provided shelter to homeless men during extreme cold snaps. You can see how political patronage got a strong start in the saloon community. So by 1907, there were 622 saloons in Kansas City, Missouri. They paid $250 every six months for a liquor license. 75% of that was paid by the brewers who actually owned the buildings usually and the fixtures inside of them. Most of the revenue from licenses went into a fund to maintain city streets and county roads. Largely for that reason, opponents of saloons 
believed the breweries were controlling city officials, and they were right. Major breweries from St. Louis and Milwaukee were represented here, including Pabst, Blatz, Schlitz, and Heiser Busch. We also had local breweries. There was Mule Box, which was established in 1868. Himes Beer was established in 1887. Rochester, which came along in 1888, and the short-lived Imperial Brewer Brewery, uh, which opened in 02 and closed in 05. And of course, this uh, the Imperial Brewery is still with us today, and it's visible. Uh, well, this is from I-35, but it's along uh, Southwest Boulevard there. Uh, the Kansas City Breweries Company uh, was the consolidation of Heim and Rochester in 05. But in 1905, several things led to a major change. First, the Kansas City Police Commissioners, directed by the Missouri Governor, Joseph Polk, uh, also known as Holy Joe because of his crusade against corruption, decided in March of 1905 that saloons must close on Sundays. This push, ironically, Missouri drinkers to the still flourishing Kansas City, Kansas saloons on Sundays. One KCK paper said, quote, if Barnum had pitched his tents on Central Avenue lots on Sunday, the crowds would not have been larger. Then, Kansas City, Kansas narrowly voted out its mayor, attributed to the failure of his, of his police department to close the saloons on Sunday. The new mayor announced they would be closing, but saloons said at that time to, in KCK to number 165 were allowed to operate within that fine system I told you about, usually $50 a month, sometimes paid in advance. In September, however, the governor of Kansas, uh, Edward Hoke, the uh, Hoke Auditorium in, at KU is named for him, decided that he was going to enforce the state prohibition law, starting with the state's largest city. Still, the state struggled to crack down on the city brewer cooperative system until June 1906, when this guy, C.W. Triquette, uh, was named by the governor as assistant attorney general for Wyandotte County. So with the county sheriff's help, he immediately began to raid and padlock saloons. A result was that the, the brewers lobbied the Kansas City, Missouri City Council to allow licenses for additional saloons in the West Bottoms near the state line as the Kansas actions were hurting the beer business and more saloons would need more business for other merchants in Kansas City, Missouri. But by the spring of 1907, the brewers continued to deliver beer to Kansas by wagon, but only if you ordered it in Missouri. So in 1907, uh, the Star and Times were waging their battle against the brewers. And they made a big is issue of the fact that there were over 600 saloons in town and, it, and the papers supported a new state law uh, prohibiting brewers, breweries from owning saloons. Uh, then in August came the Times' wettest block headline. The Kansas Prohibitionist newspaper took note of all the attention being paid the block and said most of these saloons had been there for 20 years already. And quote, the flow of crime has been as ceaseless as the tides of humanity that flows through that street. Indeed, back in 1889, the first five blocks east of State Line then had held 26 saloons. A visiting prohibitionist editor from New York observed that saloons, quote, swarm all the way over from the Union Depot, crowding closer and closer as they approach the point where the law says, thus far shalt thou go, but no farther. And there they stand, close up to the line, a solid row of them, in all their filth and hideousness, their screen windows and their beer mug signs, looking out over the bottom lands on the Kansas side with hungry, baleful eyes, reminding one as much as anything of a pack of ravenous beasts held here in leash by some invisible hand. 
But now, in 1907, there were 24 saloons out of 29 storefronts in a single block. Of the 24, the Times said two had black patronage. Seven were run by, quote, foreigners who sat at tables and sipped their beers. And the others had stand up brass rail bars. The buildings were described as narrow shacks, a few or two story buildings with rooms for lodgers above the saloon. One had a sign that read, Triquette can't stop interstate commerce. So all the attention was good for other business as advertised. Real estate prices were up 25% a month after the first time the story came out. Advertisers made selling, uh, made a selling point out of proximity to the wettest block. So this guy is uh, selling a property on West uh, Ninth, further in, but he's close to the West Block, so it makes that desirable. This guy is selling a cigar store in Kansas in smelling distance of the wet block. And then uh, Joe Timmer, uh, who had a hardware store, wants you to stop in and see his new gas stoves when you're down drinking in the wet block. So the elevated uh, railway ran uh, along 9th Street. This is looking west toward the armor plant there at a distance. And you can see the elevated railway similar to what's up in Chicago. And underneath it was the 5th Street cable car on street level. One reporter wrote that passengers on the L Road can tell the place in question by the fumes of beer and whiskey that make them hold their nostrils when the car stops at Armor Station, state line. Uh, here we are at the block. You can see just over the tops of the saloons, the armor sign peeking out there. Another said that with the arc lights, it had the appearance at night of a great arcade, an emporium of booze. Several saloons had multiple bars with six or eight bartenders to keep up with demand on busy nights. The beers were described as not the small ladylike ones sold in the saloons uptown, but huge man-sized keeping tubs. One saloon keeper in the block said he sold 96 gallons a day. The star kept up the stories for weeks, citing the trouble police were having with drunks passing out on the L, knife fights, gunplay, general troublemaking. During these years, the Women's Christian Temperance Union would show up at police corps meetings uh, twice a year to protest the awarding of saloon licenses. In January 1909, when the police board temporarily held up 20 saloons in the block, uh, they said the owners um, were not residents of Missouri. Rather, they were the old Kansas saloon keepers who had just moved across after they were displaced by the crackdown. The brewers then substituted legal applicants and the licenses were sustained. The new applicants were often just fronts for the originals who remained as bartenders or who kept apartments in the backs of the saloons and families in came. That July 1909, when licenses came up for renewal, the WCTU proposed a 1,000 foot dry zone buffer at the state line. This was amended to 350 feet with the provision that the licenses of all non-residents be denied and no new licenses awarded within the dry zone. This effectively thinned out the block. By fall of 1913, it was down to 13 saloons in the block from 24. The brewers, of course, fought back, maintaining the packing house workers needed their beer to drown the effects of brutal working conditions. In 1915, working with the Pendergast-influenced city council, they agreed to pay the appropriation for the police department in exchange for license approvals. And the number of saloons slowly increased, 14 by 1916 to 17 by 1917. But the temperance movement was under full steam. The Star and others took note of other neighborhoods in town with heavy saloon concentration. In 1911, most arrests were downtown but many were in districts with saloons, Westport being one of them. Uh, a map here of Westport, 
between Pennsylvania and Broadway with the saloons and pool halls and so forth uh, were actually the same thing as true today. Uh, and the stretch north of Maine, or the stretch of Maine north of the new Union Station at that, at that point uh, was another place with many saloons, uh, as well as the fuel box group. So uh, it turned out that in 1913, there was a little collection of storefronts um, up the Missouri River on the Missouri side opposite Leavenworth at a newly created railroad crossing at the foot of the bridge there. The name of the crossing, uh, Drydale, uh, was severely ironic because it consisted solely of four saloons and a dozen wholesale liquor stores, many run by Kansas City interests, catering to Kansas residents and the soldiers stationed at Fort Leavenworth. It thrived until 1917, when a deputy sheriff and a local police character each shot each other dead. Uh, 1917 was the year, of course, that America entered the World War. The new military draft law made it illegal to sell alcohol, alcohol to soldiers in uniform. The Star kept up its anti saloon campaign, focusing on soldiers and young children drinking in the block, and sometimes resorting to anti immigrant language, which was uh, widespread at the time, actually. And this is kind of the elephant in the room here, I guess, uh, because all along um, the anti-saloon movement is kind of a front for an anti-immigrant uh, movement. Immigrants being people that brought their uh, culture with them, which included, of course, alcohol and, um, and, and uh, gathering in places like saloons. So that was the year, as I said, that the, uh, the country entered the war. Complaints increased, uh, led by actually the manufacturers along the West Bottom, uh, in the West Bottoms, and Armour, who saw the West Block as a huge dead danger to its workforce. Um, influential citizens like William Volcker, joined the chorus against, yet nothing really changed. Police commissioners promised action to padlock or close the saloons, but always backed down in the face of property owners, the brewers. Finally, the block was effectively shut down by national prohibition, dwindling from 13 saloons early in 1919 to seven by that July, when wartime prohibition went into effect. So uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here talking about prohibition per se, other than to say that um, a few of the uh, saloons in the wet block stayed on as quote unquote soft drink parlors um, and were periodically raided and padlocked during the 1920s because all it took to be a speakeasy was a bartender with a uh, flask in his back pocket or hidden away somewhere pour into your ginger ale. And the other thing was that the very essence of the old saloon died during prohibition. Drinking in public, though it wasn't legal, became very much a co-ed activity. Women were voting now and drinking with men. So from uh, the end of prohibition, repeal. This is 1933, April, uh, 12th Street, Kansas City. People enjoying their first glass of legal 3.2% alcohol beer. Uh, we go from uh, saloons to uh, the new saloon is the nightclub with all kinds of entertainment and other attractions that bring people uh, uh, out to drink. And of course, that atmosphere creates uh, a, a better place for the expansion of um, the music that came out of that period. And of course, it brought more attention uh, toward the corrupt uh, government we had here in town from other papers. Uh, it brought a Frenchman uh, to the United States to, um, he initially was just canvassing different cities to see uh, where the alcohol was most plentiful. Um, and he had a list 
most of those, half a dozen lists, a half a dozen cities on his list of wettest cities. Kansas City was among them, but it wasn't uh, remarkable necessarily. However, uh, he did say that Kansas City was by far the wickedest place because of other things connected with uh, night nightlife, including prostitution, gambling, and so forth. So uh, he makes this uh, Paris connection, the streets of Paris at the worst, were nothing like Kansas City. Uh, we move on from there to 1938. This is a, a guy from the Omaha World Herald comes down to uh, investigate the tender gas uh, machine and how Kansas City runs and notes that we are proud of our sin here. And this, uh, he opened this story with the quote that you may have uh, seen, if you want to see some sin, forget about Paris and go to Kansas City. Um, from there, the same year, 1938, this guy, uh, Westbrook Taylor, who was a syndicated column, columnist from D.C., came to town, um, uh, spent a week, did the same thing, writing about the tender gas machine and all the details of life here. Uh, he had this particular column, and I don't remember which one in the week this was, but uh, this one has a quote I like best. He said that Kansas City is a great city whose reputation has suffered from the inclusion in her name of Kansas, a word signifying thin-lipped social bleakness, prohibition, and an aversion to the pleasures of others. Kansas City is more like Paris. So uh, five years later, Pegler comes back uh, to revisit Kansas City and uh, this is after Mr. Pendergast has spent time in prison and there's a new reformed government. And Pegler says, well, sir, you just wouldn't know the Paris of the Western Plains today. And this is where our, one of our nicknames actually originates. So uh, to tell the story of what's happened to the wet block since prohibition, I thought I would uh, focus on just a few of the addresses. Uh, at one time, I thought that um, there were there was only one surviving building from the old wet block down there. But uh, upon further review, I have identified three survivors. So I'm going to talk about those. The first one being uh, 1701, the first uh, one at the corner. It's not Bell Street, as it says here, but uh, Genesee on the south side of the street. It had a succession of ownerships, owners over the years. Uh, and it was the place right next door there, 1701 and a half, was actually a polling place at one time. So you could vote and then go right next door. Uh, in 1907, the kind of the peak year of the block, James Armstrong was the owner selling fine wines and whiskeys. Uh, at the outset of Prohibition, a Greek immigrant named Louis Callas owned it. Um, he was kind of a rough character who later became proprietor of Louis Keg down the block. Um, this is what the place looked like in 1940. That's one of the famous tax photos of that year. And then uh, here we are today as the lunchbox. And uh, uh, it's a liquor store as well, keeping the wet block wet. Uh, it also sells a good sandwich, I can attest to that. Um, you can see it's obviously been altered and added on to, but it's uh, underneath all that stuff, it's the same. So uh, down the street, middle of the block is uh, 17, it has two storefronts, 1715 and 1717. This, the first version of this building was a frame two story uh, with those two storefronts in 1880s upstairs was a meeting hall kind of called, uh, Hibernian hall where labor groups and political groups met and they had weddings up there from time to time on the second floor. This was also the building that one, uh, on the 1715 side that held one of, uh, Jim Pendergast saloons, the Pendergast brothers saloons where, uh, his brother Tom worked when he first came to town and may have lived for a while. Uh, there were frequent run-ins over police protected gambling games upstairs here during that period. So that building was demolished in 1911 and the Pabst Brewing Company put up a new brick work, which is what survives today. And here it is in 1940. 
Uh, there are a couple of soft drink saloons here in Prohibition uh, with repeal went on the first day of legal beer. Uh, a reporter went outside and counted 398 Kansas license plates on the cars parked outside. So during the wide open days, this is probably the, the, the one building that has the uh, most connection um, to the wide open days of the 1930s. Uh, it became best known first as the Antlers Buffet, uh, run by a guy named um, Ed Blanchard, who was the city plumbing inspector named by Tom Pendergast, who also did the boss's bidding by buying boats during election season and administering the West Bottoms version of the annual Pendergast sponsored Thanksgiving dinners for needy voters. During Prohibition, Blanchard had been part of a soft drink and gambling joint right across the street. And one night in 1927, rival gamblers wounded Blanchard and killed his wife in a drive-by shotgun shooting at their home. His partner in that saloon and the dinners was a guy named Charles Passler. And after Blanchard died in 1934, Passler's son James, known as Bus Passler, created the Antlers Club. It was known for its upstairs lounge that presented things like boxing matches and dancing. On occasion, after hours, live sex acts were part of the discreet invitation only, late night, early morning scene. A young Charlie Parker played here in a band led by former Basie band member, Buster Smith. There was gambling here as well, and the Andrews was one of the many joints in town that paid $200 a month to the Pendergast machine for the privilege. After World War II, this building, here it is today, was home to a series of taverns, starting with a place called the Keg that I mentioned earlier and ending about just 10 years ago with Corruption, which was a nightclub that sort of maintained the sense of tradition by staying open all night and offering things like belly dancers and live burlesque shows. It's now, I believe, a private residence. So the real gem in this block, in my mind, is this last one, uh, number 1724 at the corner of State Line on the north side. Known in 1893 as Flanagan Saloon. Uh, James Flanagan was an Irish immigrant who came to Kansas City in 1884, and he owned multiple saloons, some in Kansas City, Kansas, before the, uh, before the crackdown over there. In 1890, he bought this corner from the Hannibal and St. Joe Railway. He built, uh, two years later, he built this building. In 1909, the Times said there are only two other saloons in the United States which rival it in the quantity of beer sold. One is in Chicago and the other in New York. Bar was reported to be 76 feet long and out back was a pool room with 12 tables. Flanagan uh, came to sell Rochester beer only and eventually gained a partial interest in that room. And uh, when they were, when uh, Rochester and Heim merged to become the Kansas City Breweries Company, he was a major stockholder. In 1909, he sold the saloon to concentrate on real estate, and he built a warehouse on St. Louis Avenue, which is still there today. He died in 1928, and his estate was worth more than a million dollars, including property on both sides of the state line. He said uh, when he got out of the saloon business, he was quoted as saying, we have always run an orderly place here. Our customers are working men, we never sell to a vagrant, and we never sell to a man who is drunk. This place was started before there was the wettest block. Uh, during Prohibition, it was first a drugstore and a lunchroom. With repeal, this and the building one door east were joined to become the Mocan Beer Garden, uh, which was a full service restaurant nightclub with mahogany panel walls, silk drapes, white linen tablecloths, and a hardwood dance floor was owned by a guy who was in charge of collecting the gambling tributes for the Pendergast machine from the West Bottoms. Later years, it was a, it was a state line liquor store shown here in 1940. Uh, and now this place, uh, this shows a for sign. I drove by here last week and it is for sale. A golden opportunity to revive the legacy of James Flanagan and the wettest block in America which is the way this appears today looking Eastern State Line. And that's the story of the wet block as I see it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, very interesting, great, uh, wonderful imagery as well. Um, we do have some audience questions uh, coming in. Uh, before we before we get to those, I, I want to mention to our audience that John has graciously donated a copy of his book, uh, Prohibition in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Highballs, Spooners, and Crooked Dice. We're going to give away uh, this book. Um, we'll have a little trivia question. You can put your answer in the comments. So it's uh, Highballs, Spooners, and Crooked Dice. We want to know what does Spooners refer to in the book title? You can drop your answer in the comments. Uh, again, what would Spooners refer to in 1920s and 30s uh, Kansas City? Uh, so let's get to, to some of the questions. Uh, John, I had one first, a kind of a comment and a question that we think of Kansas City's 1930s Kansas City, you know, it's the wide open period uh, of Kansas City's history, but uh, in your research and what you've uh, presented today, really that wide open uh, wide openness, if you want to call it, dates back to the 1890s in terms of saloons and gambling and uh, illicit activities. Is that, uh, is that right. accurate? Yes, it, it, it's absolutely accurate. Um, back in the, in the uh, at the outset of the temperance movement, I guess, um, or at least the, the brunt of it, uh, that was pretty standard stuff. And of course, the whole reason for prohibition was this uh, cumulative effort on the parts of the Anti-Saloon League and the WCTU and so forth, because they were so incensed at what was happening from that early period onward. Uh, a lot of, uh, well, the stories that were told were, you know, about uh, families being a torn apart by by uh, too much drinking, um, uh, domestic violence, um, people losing their jobs, so forth. So this, this was a progressive movement that sought to improve society by, uh, by outlawing consumption, uh, or at least the sale of alcohol uh, going forward. So yes, it, it, it had always been a thing, but that it wasn't unique necessarily to Kansas City at all. Where Kansas City gets the wide open, um, I found from you know doing the prohibition era research, really came after prohibition uh, was repealed, um, because during prohibition Kansas City was much like every other uh, large city in the country that you could get a drink anytime you wanted to, of course, and there were corrupt politicians making that happen. But after uh, prohibition was repealed. Uh, you know, states uh, set laws governing the sale uh, of alcohol and so forth, operating saloons, operating the nightclubs. And um, uh, the saloon, or the, I should say the nightclub owners in Kansas City uh, were able to just flaunt that by, um, by ignoring the closing hours and not paying for licenses and so forth. And uh, you know, the, the powers that be allowed that to happen. That was really during the 1930s and where Kansas City got this. Hey, John, you cut out for us. You cut out there just for a second. Let's go to another audience question. Uh, someone was curious about, you mentioned that uh, the, uh, men and women drank in different saloons. Was that, um, was that by law or by social convention of the time of the period? It was, yeah, it was by uh, largely the, con the convention of the time. Women were not allowed in saloons. Um, the exception to that came a little bit uh, later, I, I think in the first decade of, of the 20th century when um, hotels like uh, Tom Pendergast Jefferson Hotel down in the uh, city market area had um, what was called a cabaret, which was um, basically a saloon, um, had musical entertainment where women were part of the, the show and they attracted, the places attracted uh, like out of town theater groups and whatnot. Uh, 
actors and performers that would come in and maybe perform there as well. Uh, so there was more mixing going on with men and women in those places, but generally it was a social convention that women didn't um, uh, didn't belong in a saloon. Okay. Another question, you know, had to do with um, a, a lot of residents embracing the kind of our our uh, sordid past, if you will, uh, with drinking and gambling, and and you definitely see it with some of the establishments, um, kind of tying into that history, especially a lot of local bars. But uh, you don't really see it from a, a tourism uh, perspective. And so an audience member member asked, you know, should the city be Kind of promoting that aspect of our history, embracing that history, um, from from a tour, you know, to draw more uh, tourists in tourism. Yeah, that's an interesting question for sure. Uh, you know, I I think that's possible to do that without being uh, gross about it and or, or offensive. Um, you know, back in at the time it was happening, uh, it wasn't really. Uh, promoted uh, in, a, in an official way, but it was accepted and, and uh, encouraged by the same people that would have said, this is, we can't have this kind of thing. Because it was good for business, uh, business owners, um, the Chamber of Commerce types um, allowed it to uh, uh, take place. And, you know, it's been said that the only reason the Pendergast machine was as powerful as it was was because people like the Chamber of Commerce and other business types allowed him to do those things because it was good for city business. So I, I think, um, you know, as long as you take a historical uh, uh, approach to that kind of tourism, it's great. Uh, it's an interesting part of our history and certainly maybe the most interesting part people uh, love to talk about it and sort of flaunt it at every possible opportunity. But yeah, I, I would love to have more of that. Yeah, as evidenced by this program and the and the wettest block event that the uh, the historic West Bottoms puts on uh, uh, annually, right. you know, we do uh, in, in some ways celebrate that part of our of our history. Uh, I'll, I'll remind the audience if you have a question uh, for John, um, go ahead and put it in the comments if you have a answer to to win a free book uh, as far as the what is spooners referred to in the 1920s and 30s and in the title of his prohibition book go ahead and put that in the comments uh, uh one another question that came in are there temperance fountains in kansas city temperance i'm sorry it says are there temperance fountains in kansas city are there fountains that are don't know that i don't yeah. know it is that no, there's none that I've seen. Um, that's interesting. What is a temperance fountain? I would assume it's a. It, it was kind of in dedication of the the movement. Would be my interpretation. I, I might be way off in that respect. Uh, if someone knows, you can drop that in the comments as well. Of, of if you want to be more. Uh, if you have. If there's a specific uh, temperance fountain, fountain that was uh, constructed uh, during that period. Um, Again, if you have a question for John, go ahead and put that in the comments as we're getting ready to wrap up. Uh, John, one one thing I really liked was the advertisement. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Was that the uh, Joe Timmer Hardware Store um, <laughs> that advertised as being near the you know the wettest block? Um, I, I wonder how many you know husbands told their wives at that time that you know I'm just going to go down to the you know to the Timmer Hardware Store to pick up a few things and. And then end up, you know, drink, uh, get, pick up a tub of beer. I think, as, as you said, that they that's what they, the size they served down <laughs> in there. Um, one, of the, one of those man sized tubs. I'm sure a lot. Uh, yeah, I've got to just run down and uh, check into that new gas stove with Joe Timber. I'll be back in a few hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, right. I just um, thought that, I just thought that was interesting that, uh, it, and that was immediate after this uh, publicity that so many people thought that was a, a, a thing to connect to whatever they were trying to sell. That was cool. I, I have one final book or one final question in your book. Um, 
you mentioned that you quoted a, a, a Kansas judge in 1917 that said if, if the wet block were to be abolished, the police court uh, could be closed. There, there's some hy hyperbole in that statement, um, but maybe some truth to it as well. H have you found any statistics as far as uh, the, like crime uh, related to that area of, of, the, of the wettest block? Uh, no statistics, um, but that was a frequent um, utterance, especially on the Kansas. Uh, the police court wouldn't be busy at all if it weren't for the. And I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. But you know, as you say, the type of things, they were trying to shut the places down. I do have I do have one other uh, memory from that from the research was that on the Missouri side uh, the uh, the police, second precinct police station down on Mulberry um, the chief of the police that ran that uh, mentioned that um, the two busiest uh, beats the two toughest beats in the West Bottoms were the Union Depot which by the way was the very wet block too, as a matter of fact, um, and wet block. Those two places were the, the sources of most trouble in the West Bottom. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, uh, so I'm gonna wrap the, the program up. Two things, someone uh, did uh, uh, inform us that the, the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, used to erect water fountains to highlight how important water was often near uh, saloons. So I, I don't recall seeing one in Kansas City. I, I am going to look, uh, research that. Um, uh, also, um, I'll mention to our trivia question, uh, John, do you want to share with everyone what, a, what spooners, the definition of spooners from the 1920s and 30s? Uh, well, so uh, in my grandparents' day, spooning was just uh, another word for uh, petting or making out. But... Um, Specifically, the newspaper coverage during the prohibition talked about spooners being people that uh, would park in their cars out in country roads uh, to, um, you know, uh, be amorous. And uh, at, at one point, because so many people were getting um, attacked by, you know, uh, highwaymen uh, in those situations, uh, spooners moved into the Union Station parking lot where the lights were on all night and it was a safer atmosphere for them. So they ended up down there for a while. So if you had some, ver if your answer was some version of, of couples in parked cars, we'll, uh, we'll accept that. Uh, John, I wanna thank you. Um, it's, it's always great to have you. I think this is maybe your third or fourth time um, uh, joining us for a speaking engagement. Um, uh, Finally, uh, any uh, re research project that uh, on the horizon or anything you want to share? Oh, I'm working on uh, lots of stuff. I have so much material left over from my Paris of the Plains blog that I could create um, a new book out of that. But yes, I do have some other things that I'm not ready to um, talk about yet, though. Thanks okay. for asking. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our audience. And um, again, um, we have a lot of excellent programs coming up in June. Go to our website, kclibrary.org, uh, for those dates and, and times. Thank you.